let's continue. So the, the final topic that I want to talk about that we can use, you know, use our browsers to do investigation and experimentation on using the plugins and some of the other browser tools that were mentioned in the first section is authentication. So this is, we've heard this from several folks. Um, you know, they, they have questions about how do I get authenticated with an OSLC provider and, you know, so that I can start accessing resources. Um, OSLC itself does not force any particular type of authentication on you. Um, folks hear OAuth a lot um, in relationship to authentication in OSLC, and some folks make the assumption that, oh, geez, I've got to do OAuth if I want to do anything with OSLC. If I want to be an OSLC provider, I've got to provide OAuth. Or if I want to be a consumer, that's the only way I can consume OSLC services. And that's not the case. Um, the, the, the Rational Jazz servers do make um, extensive use of OAuth as well as you know other services on the web. Um, OAuth is becoming an increasingly popular uh, authentication method, a way for applications to be able to access protected resources without having to store user credentials themselves. And uh, we'll go through an example of how that works. But you know some some common forms of authentication that could be used by both OSLC consumers and providers. You just have to know you know what your provider. Um, gives you access to um, basic authentication, which is something that's very simple to do programmatically, but is you know not very secure. It's basically just a Base64 encoded um, user ID password <coughs> uh, hash in the header. Um, should only be done over HTTPS. Um, a second type of authentication, um, one that comes out of the box with the Rational Jazz servers, is form authentication. Um, it's a little more secure, but again, you're you're still sending user IDs and passwords, so it should be done over HTTPS. Um, it, it can be a little bit trickier to do programmatically. Um, different implementations of form authentication have their own protocols, different URLs that you need to hit in a certain order in order to get successfully authenticated. Um, we do have, a, as I mentioned before, there's a, a consumer client library coming soon in the Eclipse Leo project that will help um, do form authentication with rational jazz servers. So if you're interested in that, you know, be sure to take a look at that in the Eclipse Leo project. Uh, the other thing about form authentication is you do have to have user credentials. You have to have a user ID and a password. So your application would have to, you know, persist that somewhere or prompt for it every time that it started up. Um, a third type of authentication is OAuth. And there's two versions of OAuth, 1.0 uh, and 1.0a. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the differences. Um, with OAuth, there's no need for the client program to persist user passwords. Um, we're going to rely on um, some user interaction, though. The users, as we start to interact with a provider, um, we're going to need a user to authorize our access to protected resources. And I'll show you how that works. And um, the so-called OAuth dance. You know that we have to go through with different tokens and authorization of those tokens uh, can be frustrating to learn. Um, you know, I've heard several folks express frustration about just, you know, what do I need to do in order to successfully get through this OAuth dance? Um, so that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. So, in the sim simple form, this is what needs to be done. The first thing you need before you even get started is your ap your application that wants to access uh, resources on the, on the provider that supports OAuth, it has to have a consumer key and a shared secret. So th there's a lot of different ways that consumer key can get created. It can be done manually by an administrator. Um, there might be some web applications have a process where you can register your application with them. Um, you log on to their website and say, you know, here's, here's my application's URL and you know, give me a consumer key here. I'll provide the, the secret. Um, for, the, for the Rational Jazz servers, there's two ways that you can create a consumer key. You can do it manually through the admin pages, or there's a way to do it programmatically. I'm not going to go through that, but one of those URLs that we saw from the root services document is a URL that you can access and generate a consumer key um, programmatically. I'm just going to give a quick example of doing it um, through, the, through the UI. So if I go over to my um, RTC server here, if I go to the um, administration pages, there's a section of the administration UI um, for consumers. And I'm going to create a new consumer. I'm going to call it, I can give it any name I want. I'm going to call it OSLC demo. I need to, we're going to have a shared secret. So 
the server will have access to the secret and my consumer application needs access to the secret. And I'll show you in a, in a minute how that secret is used. And I'm going to say it's trusted. So I'm going to register. And what happens when I do that register is you can see there's a new entry down here that has um, my application, OSLC demo, and my consumer key. This is the important thing here. That's what we're going to use as part of this the, the so-called OAuth dance. So I need a consumer key. I've done that. The second thing I need is I need to use my consumer key and my shared secret, and I need to get what's called a request token. So this is the start of the, um, the protocol. Um, so in order to access a protected resource, I need to get a, a, a what's called a request token, and then I need to get a user that's um, authorized on the system to um, authorize my request token. So first let me get the request token. I'm going to do step two here. Um, and I'll be using that Netflix um, test tools that we saw earlier. So the, the URL that I need to go to to get a request token is this one right here. And again, this was from the root services document. So I get the request token. I go to the Netflix tool. And the URL I want to go to is that. And the other thing I need is my consumer key. So let me jump back to RTC quickly. I get my consumer key. And I put that in this field. And the final thing I need in order to generate this request is my shared secret. So my top secret, shared secret there. And um, all, all OAuth flows, um, all OAuth requests are signed using you know, various parts of the content of it. One of the parts is timestamp. Um, you can't let the timestamp get too old or else you'll get um, you'll get error messages back saying, you know, you're trying to use an expired an expired token. So it's good to refresh the timestamp and get it relatively recent before you um, make these requests. So when I click do it here, what the Netflix tool does for me is it generates the URL that I need to go to. So the first part of the URL here is exactly what I put in up here. It's the OAuth request token URL. And there's a whole bunch of um, additional OAuth parameters that it adds on. Um, <clears throat> So, so the Netflix test tool is doing that for us. If you were doing this programmatically, you would be using an OAuth library. You'd not be generating these yourself. There's, um, I have references in the presentation to um, OAuth libraries for different programming languages. Um, I've used a Java one that's um, on Google Code. It's a very nice one. It takes care of generating you know, all these different uh, pieces, all these different parameters for OAuth for you. So I'm going to copy this URL. <coughs> I'm going to go back over here. Oh, wait, one thing that I forgot to do, sorry, is normally you're using the post method. So let me regenerate it because that is part of the signature. I'm going to copy that URL. Get rid of all this content. Okay, what I'm, so I'm just pasting in you know, straight out of the Netflix tool, oops, that URL that starts with, you know, the request token and then has all those additional OAuth parameters. I can get rid of if match. I can get rid of content type. I won't need those anymore. So what I'm going to do is a post to that URL. And what I get back is two things. I get back an OAuth token and a, a token secret. Um, the next step in the dance is I need to get a user of my application, a user of the application that I want to access needs to authorize access to this token that I've got. So there's um, every OAuth supporting um, application advertises a URL that users can go to in order to authorize tokens. So in the case of the Rational Team Concert, again, in the root services document, there's an, a user authorization URL. So what I need to do is I need to redirect a user to that URL and 
provide the token that I got as a temporary request token and say, it's basically my way of saying, uh, Mr. User, please authorize this uh, token for me, this re request token that I got. So let me go ahead and do that. Uh, see, before I do it, let me log out. So I'm going to go to that URL, and I'm going to provide the request. Uh, sorry. This token that I got <clears throat> as a parameter on the request. So the OAuth token that I got back when I hit the request token URL is what I'm going to provide as a parameter on this request to the user authorization URL. Actually, so you can see what's happening. Let me, uh, let me go to my home page. Okay, and then I'm going to hit that URL. <clears throat> so for the Jazz products, that takes me to a login. So basically, I'm asking... Um, the user to authorize this token for me by logging into the, the Rational Team concert. So I'm going to log in. And once that's done, um, th that token is now authorized. So what I can do as the last part, um, one of the last parts of the OAuth dance, is now I can exchange this temporary request token that I have for an access token. And what the access token will let me do is actually access protected resources on the server. So um, things that that user had, would have had access to, the user who authorized my token, I'll now have programmatic access to the, the same set of resources. Um, so the way that I exchange the request token for the access token is like this. The first thing I need to know is the access token URL. So that, that's the third and final URL that we're going to use here. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to paste it into the Netflix tool. And the additional things that I'm going to have to provide are this token in secret. And this is basically the request token in secret that's already been authorized for us. So if I go back to this tab here, I have a token. And again, this is what was returned when I hit the request token URL. So I get that token. And then I need the secret as well. And the secret here is URL encoded. So in order to use it with the Netflix tool, I need to URL de decode it. So if you want to do this, you know, copy these same steps in your own browser, you'll need to do this step as well. If you just try to paste the secret into the, the Netflix tool, um, it won't generate a valid, um, a valid uh, OAuth set of parameters for you. So you need to go to a URL decoder. I'm going to say decode it, and then I can just copy and paste this as my secret into the Netflix tool. So I've got my consumer key, my shared secret, my request token and secret, uh, the path to, the, to where I exchange my request token for my access token, and I'm doing a post. So I'm going to refresh the timestamp. I'm going to generate a new, new URL to hit. And if I hit this URL, I'm going to delete the one I had before. If I hit this, then I get the final thing that I need here. So what I got back was another token in secret, but this time instead of a temporary request token in secret, I've got back the actual access token in secret that's going to let me um, access protected resources um, on, the, on the server. So let's real quickly prove that this works. Um, I'm going to go, go back to the RTC web, and I'm going to log out. So now I don't, I'm not authenticated uh, with RTC any longer. And if I go back here, um, let me go to a work item. Well, I can try to go to the cat. Oh, so here's a work item. Let me go to the catalog. Catalogs are a protected resource on on a Jazz server. So if I try to do a get on the catalog right now, I get back that HTML that we saw earlier that said you haven't authenticated with the server yet. So I'm going to try to access the same URL with using OAuth, um, the, the OAuth information that I have. So I would go to the Netflix tool. I would put in the path that I want to access. So I want to access the catalog there. And 
instead of instead of the request token in secret, I'm going to use the access token in secret I got back on that last exchange. And I'm going to decode the secret again. And, I said, whoops, let me refresh the timestamp just to be good. So that gives me the URL. And again, you can see that at least the first part of this is to access the catalog like I wanted to do before. So if I go back over here, and instead of this URL, I use that full one with all of the OAuth parameters on it. I do a send request. Oh, oh man. I did something wrong there. Let me see if I can check this real quick. My apologies, live demos. And let me get the secret again. Oh, I know I did wrong. Notice I still had post as the action. Okay, so that that was my bug. So there's a there's a lesson learned. I was actually want, trying to do a get on this URL, but when I generated the um the OAuth parameters, I left the action as post, and the action is actually part of the um the signature. So if we have a mismatch between you know what I did when I generated all of the the OAuth parameters, and when I um you know, did it in the browser, there was a mismatch there. That's, you know, the other big value of using an uh, OAuth library is that you don't have to worry about that. Based on the type of action you're trying to perform, it's going to generate, you know, it's going to feed the right set of parameters into the um, into the generation of the signature. And that's probably one of the trickiest parts of using OAuth. So let me see if I'm living right. So I've got a get. I've got my... URL, yeah, still didn't go. Let me try it with a different timestamp. I apologize for this. Okay, there it goes. It was the timestamp was bad. So it, these are some of the pitfalls that you can hit is that um, you know, you're using too old of a timestamp. So when you're doing it from a browser, these are easy mistakes to make, as I just, you know, obviously showed there. You know, using the wrong verb um, when you're generating the URL or using an out-of-date timestamp. But if you're using a library, um, a lot of those things get taken care of for you. So, you know, we went through all these steps in the OAuth dance. I'll try to wrap things up here. Um, we went through all these steps in the OAuth dance, and, you know, that was a lot of work just to access something in a browser. Um, you know, and that's why... You know, shows the benefit of using a library for this type of access. Um, an additional thing that we're you know, committing to the to the Eclipse Leo project is uh, basically a client um, library that you can use that helps with all the um, OAuth uh, dance. You basically say you want to get a resource that's protected by OAuth, and you provide it with those URLs um, that we saw before, and you know, it'll take care of going through all of that, all of the OAuth dance for you. So using a good library, whether it's, you know, just OAuth itself or whether it's one specific to, you know, an OSLC, getting OSLC resources like we're providing in Eclipse Leo, um, you know, really simplifies things for you. But it is possible to go through the steps in a browser if you just want to see the gory details of it. Um, one thing, I won't cover it um, in the demo, but there is um, something called what I just showed was the flow for OAuth 1.0. There is a flow called OAuth 1.0a, and I'll create a separate video for posting on YouTube that shows the 1.0a flow, um, so that if folks want to see the difference between 1.0 and 1.0a, 
uh, you can go out to, to YouTube. We'll provide the, the URL for that. Um, see the differences between 1.0 and 1.0a. But it basically, the purpose of 1.0a was to fix a vulnerability in uh, OAuth 1.0, something called a session fixation attack. And it um, requires some a couple of the use of a couple of additional parameters um, in that dance that we just did. Um, for the Rational Jazz products, the, the 2x and 3x versions support OAuth 1.0, and 4x supports 1.0 and 1.0a. Um, that's all I really had. Here's some additional resources. We'll make these um, slides available to you, but some different things to look at. As I mentioned before, um, I think something of benefit to folks that you know want to use OSLC as a as a consumer, um, especially talking, perhaps talking to some of the Jazz client of uh, the Jazz. Uh, implementations is this client library that we're working on for Eclipse Leo. So that, that should be available soon. Any questions before I wrap up? I'm about 10 minutes over here. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody uh, that was able to attend today. Um, if you have any questions, you know, please go ahead and um, shoot me an email, or I'd encourage folks interested in writing code to subscribe to the um, Leo uh, Dev mailing list, and uh, go ahead and ask any questions you might have out there.